kind of look at what our values are and just keep that <clears throat> before us as a church so that we don't deviate and get off doing a bunch of stuff that we don't need to be doing that have no eternal value uh, to it at all. Uh, powerful, um, I think, um, set of values that we have. And uh, everything, you may not know this, but everything in our budget has to fit one of those values. And if it's uh, a line item in there that doesn't, we can't say, well, it fits here or fits there, then we don't fund it. It has to fit in one of those. And uh, today is the last one of the five. Hey, let's go back over it for just a minute. I want to see what kind of students you really are. You know, after 10 years, we really ought to remember uh, what these values are. And, and I'll help you with a few hints. Uh, it's the acrostic for First Baptist Church Indian Trail, okay? F-B-C-I-T. Uh, so we're, we're, we're in a classroom now, and students, what does the F stand for? Focused outreach. That's exactly right. Okay. A handful of you knew what that was. Some of you know it. You're just afraid you're going to be wrong and you'll be hurt. But <clears throat> what does the B stand for? Okay, biblical truth. The C, Christ-centered worship. The I, uh huh, and the T stands for today, transformed lives. Good class. I'll give you an A on that. Some of you kind of shy and don't want to speak out in church, but transformed lives. Now today's message from First Timothy chapter number one. Paul is addressing his young preacher boy, Timothy. And he's given Timothy some advice on how to pastor his church. And in the process of that, Paul gets real personal. As a matter of fact, he just kind of lays his soul bare before Timothy and before us and lets us see inside of his whole life. Now, would you agree with me this morning that you and I are living in an age when integrity is in great question? To me, it's very refreshing for a Christian leader uh, to really get genuine and get real and get transparent uh, before all of us. Now, here's the deal. You heard uh, Matthew a few minutes ago talking about his uh, personal testimony. Do you know that every Christian has a testimony? Now yours may not be dramatic. It may not be real exciting. And that was one of the deterrents to Matthew was is that he got listening to all these drunks and drug addicts and prostitutes being delivered and set free and saved. And here he was, he grew up in a Christian home, never deviated from the teachings of his mom and daddy and didn't feel like he had a testimony. But you know, every Christian has a testimony. Every one of us, by the way, may I, may I say this? If you don't have a testimony, then you are a mission field that needs to be evangelized. But every Christian can, uh, should be able to say, this was what my life was like before I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. This is how I trusted Christ as my Savior. And this is my life now since I have trusted Christ as my Savior. This is who I was and this is who I am today. Every Christian ought to have and does have a testimony. So stand with me and let's read for just a minute about Paul's transformation. And let's read his testimony for a minute, beginning in verse number 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me for he's counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 
of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to God one more time in prayer. Father, again, we ask for the strength to deliver your word this morning. I pray that my mouth would be a tool and an instrument of your grace and your mercy to extend before a very needy people. And may Jesus be glorified in everything that we say and everything that we do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And let me preach not for fame or fortune, but to the end that someone might believe and in believing they might have everlasting life. I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, and all God's people said amen. Thank you. Be seated. I, I want to talk to you a few minutes here uh, about the power of a transformed life. The power of a transformed life. Now, Paul, in these very select few verses, uh, gives us an ascending scale, who I used to be and what's going on in my life now. And it is those, that process today uh, that I want us to look at, that process of ascending scale of his testimony. The first thing uh, that I want you to see with me is what I call an accurate assessment. An accurate assessment. Notice what Paul says. Uh, as he begins in verse 13, he begins to give us a little look into his past. Now, every one of us in this room have a B.C. past a before Christ past. Now what Paul says in verse 13 is, he says, my past was filled with blasphemy and persecutions and violence. Uh, as a blasphemer, he blasphemed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a blasphemer, he cursed everything that was sacred and holy. As a prosecutor, uh, Paul had determined that he, if he had to single-handedly, would wipe out from the face of the earth anything that related to Christianity. And he made it his personal obsession. He made it his personal ambition uh, to kill and to persecute and to incarcerate as many Christians as he possibly could. But he went beyond just the persecution of the followers of Christ. He went beyond just the persecution of the church itself. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, I even persecuted Jesus. Now I want you to turn in your Bible to Acts chapter number 9. And just look with me there for just a moment. Acts chapter 9. And pick it up in verse number 1, if you would. Acts chapter 9 and uh, verse number one, notice what Paul uh, is, is said about Paul here. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus and to the synagogues, that if he found any by the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly... There shined round about him a light from heaven. He fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, now watch this, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, he persecuted the church. He persecuted the people in the church. And Jesus himself said that he was persecuted by Saul. In chapter 22 of the book of Acts, in chapter 26 in the book of Acts, he went into these foreign cities obsessed, addicted to the persecution of every saint of God that he could find in the way. 
Now, notice what else he says in verse 13. Not only was he a blasphemer, not only was he a persecutor, he was a very violent man. The word there really says he was insolent. He verbally assaulted. He personally abused and slapped and saw that Christians were murdered and slaughtered. Now then, that was his past. Let me ask you about your past. Go back and look now at your past. You would say, well, preacher, I would never, ever blaspheme uh, the Spirit of God. I, I, I would never curse the holy and sacred things. I, I would never come against the advancement of the kingdom of God. I, I would never impede the work of God in this earth. I, I would never be a hindrance uh, to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me ask you another question. If you would never impede the work, how are you advancing the kingdom of God? How are you promoting the kingdom of God? How are you building the kingdom of God? You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you're not with me and for me, then you are against me. So what about your past? What, what, what was going on in, in your life? I, I'm convinced with all of my heart that what we have grown up supposedly within the body of Christ is really a bunch of well-educated pagans. You see, there was an accurate assessment of one who was not born again that identifies the very fact that this is a person that is without hope and without purpose and without meaning. So let me go on to the second. You ready? Number two in this ascension is, uh, the best thing I could call it, was an abundant award. An abundant award. Now watch this in verse 13 one more time. Uh, we're back in Timothy now, okay? In 1 Timothy 1, 13, who was before a blasphemer, persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did this stuff in my past ignorantly and in unbelief. Now, I obtained mercy. You ought to underline that word. You ought to highlight it, circle it, and draw attention to it somehow uh, in your Bible. Now, I'm about to fall here if I'm not careful. Um, I'm not the most coordinated person. If you think this is easy to do, y'all come up here and I'll give you my notes. <laughs> Just tease. Just tease. Yeah, we ought to highlight that word, obtained mercy. Because the fact of the matter is, most of us in this room today don't have a real clue of the depth of the meaning of that word mercy. Uh, let, let me give you a good working definition, if I could. Uh, you, you've heard some of that stuff before, but let, let me give you a little different slant, if I might. Uh, let me give you that as I talk about it. You ready? Mercy, the divine pity that moves God to accept us. The divine pity that moves God to accept us. 1 Peter chapter 1 says that by his great mercy, we have been born again to a life of hope. You understand that the Lord Jesus saw us uh, in, his, uh, in all of our sin and he was moved in his spirit to have pity against us that moved toward us as he then extended his mercy to us. 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, is a major contrast between believers and unbelievers. And in that uh, epistle, he's saying the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is that a believer has received the mercy of God and an unbeliever has not received the mercy of God. Now, Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, we have been regenerated not by deeds of righteousness, but by his mercy, he has saved us. 
Now what Paul is saying here, even though my past was black in sin, I have obtained the mercy of God. I have received his mercy. Now watch this little transition that happens in verse number 14 as he moves from mercy to grace. Watch it now, verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now, get hold of this because I think you know it, but let, let's just make sure. There is a difference between mercy and grace. Shake your head like that, Pastor. I'm tracking with you. I hadn't gone to sleep yet. I, I'm, I'm still hanging in there with you. You see, mercy is a demonstration of the pity of God. Grace has everything in the world to do with our status. Uh, but mercy is that pity of God that has been extended toward us. I may be walking down the street and I come across a homeless guy over here, hadn't had a bath in six months and, and really not had a good meal in forever and he reeks of horrible smell and, and, and the clothing was ratted and torn and you look over and you say, man, I, that, that, that's so pitiful. And, 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 and sir, sir I, I, I really pity you and the plight of your life. Well, what's he going to do? He's going to look up, well, you pity me, then what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What, what's going to change about it? You, you got this emotion going on, but how is that going to move you into any kind of action? You, you see, God moves from pity to grace and extends to us, every one of us, that which we don't deserve. Every Sunday morning, it's, it's, it's really a favorite saying, I think, of about half the congregation. When you meet people in the hallway and you address them, maybe you say, how you doing today? And here's, that, here's their, their typical response. They say, well, better than I deserve. You, you hear that in your Sunday school classes? You hear that in the hallways? Well, it's better uh, than I deserve. One, one of the deals that uh, really, it's kind of aggravating sometimes, Somebody will seek you out and they will say to us, uh, well, if, if God were a just God, why, why does he allow all of these infant diseases? If God were a just God, why does he allow all of this homelessness? If God were a just God, then why are there so many abortions? If God were a just God, why is there so much sickness and illness and disease? And why is there so much addictions? And why is there so much injustices that are going on in the world? Why does he, if God were so adjust? Now, that kind of makes your blood boil just a little bit when you hear that. Because you immediately think in your mind, by, from the person that's saying that, you really don't have a clue about the nature of God. Now, I, for one, am grateful that you and I are not recipients of the justice of God. If, if, if somehow God were to extend his justice, I promise you there'd be a big barbecue. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? He would just, you know, the real conversation is, and the real questions is, why hasn't God just zapped everybody on the earth? Why hasn't he just annihilated all of us if God were to extend his justice? But he has extended his grace toward us and gave me the opposite of what we really deserved. We, we say this in our evangelism classes that Jesus, while he was on the cross, was given that which he did not deserve in order for you and I to be given that which we, that we, which we don't deserve. He received what we deserve. It's an amazing thing. The grace of God. Now notice this little phrase in there. Exceeding abundant. That, that's powerful two words. What does that mean? Can I just say to you, it means that when God gets ready and when God dispenses his grace toward us, he doesn't use an eyedropper to do it. 
but he lavishes his grace out on us. He pours his grace out on us. He covers us completely uh, with his grace. The Bible says where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. When sin increased, grace did much more increase. And you got saved the day that you turned away from sin and placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, God covered you with his grace and gave us all a whole lot more than we deserve. Paul is saying, even though I was the worst of all of the sinners, I've been given this covering. Does the name John Newton mean a whole lot to anybody? John Newton, of course, uh, wrote many of the great hymns that uh, we have sung down through the years and um, still sing from time to time. But John, John Newton was not always a hymn writer. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was one of the most perverted, ungodly, thieves, perverted, slave trader, sawed-off scoundrel, incongestible person that you might find on the face of the earth. But one day, a spirit-filled, born-again man came up to him just out of the blue, just totally out of left field, and encountered John Newton with the gospel. John Newton immediately had his eyes opened up and received Christ Jesus as his Lord and Savior and was gloriously changed that day never to be the same. He took an old uh, piece of wood and he carved out this and put it over the mantle of his house so he would never forget. He said, uh, John Newton, thou shalt remember that thou was in the land of Egypt and the Lord thy God redeemed you. Right before he died, John Newton wrote his own epitaph, which is now engraved in the marble tombstone at the head of his casket. And here's what he wrote, and here's what's engraved. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. May I just say to everybody in here in this room, when the Lord Jesus Christ becomes your Savior, He delivers you from your pathetic past and sets you free. Hey, let me give you number three. You ready? It's what's called an authoritative assignment. An authoritative assignment by Jesus. Watch this in verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You ought to underline the word faithful saying. It is recorded three times uh, in the New Testament, twice in Timothy and once in Titus. It, it really means on the authority of the apostles. This is an authoritative saying. This is the truth. This is something that you can count on. This is something that you can bank on. In, in, in one swoop here in this verse, he says, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, everything that comes down through the pipe will some way try to steal away your loyalty. There's going to be a lot of good causes and there's going to be a lot of positive things that are going to come your way to take away what God has genuinely called you to do. By the way, the older I get, the more sensitive I am to this very thing here in Scripture. Without fail, nearly every week, if not sometimes two or three times a week, somebody will come and they will pitch something to me that is a good thing. And I'll have to get away with the Lord and I'll have to pray and I'll have to seek the Lord about that stuff and find out, God, is, is this from you? Are you sending this? Is this something 
But I'm learning more and more and more to say no to stuff like that because it takes me away from what God has called me to do. Takes away from what, by the way, I could run for president. I believe I could win. I, I do. But, but you know what? I would have to step down to become president of the United States. It is, what, what I do is much higher calling than, than given to POTUS. I, I promise you, this is what Paul is saying uh, to Timothy here. There is a higher calling, and that is to preach the gospel so that the blood of Jesus Christ can save souls for all of eternity. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus did not come into this world to make this world a better place to live. He did not come here to pitch some new ideology. He did not come into this world to present to this world a new philosophy. He came into this world for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to save sinners from their sin. That's his purpose. Now, did he come into the world to forgive sins? Yes. That's what he came for. Just to escape hell? No, that's a good motivation. No. Just to get into heaven? No, but that's a good motivation. But he came to save sinners and to set them free from the bondage of sin so that they could walk in victory down here on this earth until such time that God takes them home to be with him forever. That's what he came to do. By the way, church, let me just... Narrow that down just a little bit. We don't exist here. Are you listening? We don't exist here to bring attention to First Baptist Church and Indian Trail. But we are to go into the highways and into these hedges. And we are to confront those people who are being sucked down the drainage of sin to carry them into hell. And to snatch them out of that pit for Jesus' sake. That's what we're to do. And, and folks, as long as God allows me to pastor, uh, we must, as a ministry, keep that on the front burner of everything that we do. That's what Jesus came to do. Can I get an amen? Let me give you number four. It's an almighty authentication. An al almighty authentication. Uh, now, you're going to see something in verse 16 that occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. Uh, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. Underline that word pattern. To them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now, notice the words for this cause. No other place in the New Testament that you will find this. He's, asking, he's making this statement, for this reason. Now, now what reason is he talking about? Uh, is he talking about being saved and delivered and having the addiction of his life broken? Uh, was he talking about his life being redirected uh, on the road to Damascus? What reason, what cause is he talking about? Is he saying, in order to get me into heaven? No, that's a good cause, that's a good reason, but it's not the reason. To have sins forgiven, that's a good reason, but not the reason. He says, for this cause, for this reason, God made me a model. God made me a forerunner that I could be a show and tell peace for all men everywhere that no matter how bad their past has been, no matter the depth of their sin, no matter how far away from God that they have gone, God can still set you free and deliver you and put you over here as an example of his grace and mercy for everybody else to see. That's the reason. Now, the word pattern there, the word uh, for this cause in verse 16, for a pattern is the word uh, prototype, forerunner, or model. 
Uh, you've probably heard the story about an old boy coming home early from work one day and he found his wife and about three or four other women as they were sitting around the table and they were discussing their husbands. And, and he, instead of going on upstairs, they, they didn't even know he had come in, but uh, instead of him going on upstairs, he, he said, I'm going to listen in on this just a little bit. And he heard one woman and she said, you know, my husband snores so loud, he rattles the walls every night and I, I can't sleep. Another old gal, she said, you don't have anything. My husband burps and belches at the table. The dishes in the cabinet will just crack. That old gal, she said, hmm, that's nothing. You ought to just see the mess my husband makes after he takes a shower. It's worse than a walrus had got up there in that bathtub and poured water everywhere. Well, he couldn't stand it. He wondered what my wife's going to say about me. So he just kept on listening. Minute or two, he heard her say, my husband is a model husband. Boy, he felt good about himself. He said, I'm just going to go on upstairs now, take a bath, change clothes. He got walking up the steps, model, model. He got to thinking about that word, model, model. Hmm. So he went, well, what did my wife mean about that? So he got Webster's Dictionary out and he looked, model, a cheap imitation of the real thing. <laughs> mm. Mm. Paul says, I am God's showpiece in the window of life so that when people walk by, they look at me and they're thinking, wow, I remember what he was like before. He sure is different now and I want what he had. That, that's the mission of our life. Paul is saying, you know, thank God I'm not what I used to be. I'm not everything I need to be right now, but I know what I'm going to be one of these days in glory. We're seeing stuff today in America I never dreamed that we would ever encounter. We're, we're seeing addictions and immorality in ways that I have never thought that we would ever see. I, I'm watching people and witnessing as people are struggling with all kinds of issues in this life. People running here and running there, not knowing what they are to do or where they are to go. You, you see, the Apostle Paul had this addiction. He had this obsession that I'm going to kill as many Christians. I'm going to wipe them from the face of the earth. He hated Jesus. He hated all of the followers of Jesus. But on the road to Damascus, Dr. Jesus broke through and broke all of his addictions. And may I say to every one of you in this room this morning, he can do the same thing for you that he did for the Apostle Paul. And he can do the same thing for you that I see that he's done for many others sitting in this room today. If they had the time and the opportunity would stand and testify, let me tell you what God delivered me from. He can do the same thing for you. I don't care what kind of past you have. I don't care how deep in sin you have gone, how far away from God that you have grown. I don't care what mounting sin that you have going on, what addictions now that envelop your life. I'm here to tell you God is still the same today as he was yesterday and he can do for you what no one else can do for you. He will set you free. He will break those chains. He will transform your life. You know what I'm convinced of? If God had a bunch of advisors and God doesn't have any advisors, but if God had any advisors, they probably whispered, they would have whispered in his ear, God, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but there's no boy from Tarsus over there that's causing a lot of damage to what you're trying to accomplish. And God, if I were you, I'd wipe him out. I'd stop him cold in his tracks. I'd deal with him, put him in the ground is what I'd do. <laughs> Not God. God would have looked at him and said, boys, let me show you what I'm going to do. He did stop him in his tracks. But he didn't wipe him out. He transformed him and used him 
for the glory of his own name to the point that this old boy wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Glory to God. Transformation. <laughs> Let me give you one more, okay? It's called an automatic adoration. And it was spontaneous. It, it was off the cuff. It was immediate in verse 17. Now he begins to praise. He begins to adore. Unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This was not in the bulletin. It was not planned. He was just excited about what God had done in his life and how he had transformed him. And he says, the number one thing I want to do in my life is just praise the Lord for what he has done for me. We used to sing an old song, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Hmm. A little over 30 years ago, in northern London, there was a captain of the Salvation Army. He was a chaplain there. And uh, he came as a little bit of an evangelist. And he, he was going to have a four-day meeting uh, there, five-day, excuse me, five-day meeting in, in that Salvation Army chapel. And so he preached on Sunday and then Sunday night. Now, as he got ready to give the invitation there was a big old burly young man on the back row back there. As soon as the invitation started, he bolted out the back door. On Monday night, preacher preached, got ready to give that gospel invitation, started into the invitation. As soon as he did, that same guy sitting in the same seat jumped up and ran out of the building. Tuesday night, he did the same thing. Wednesday night, he did the same thing. Thursday night, the preacher said, if he's here... I'm, I'm going to do something about this. So on Thursday night, before he gave the invitation, he stopped to have prayer and went down the aisle and got at the back door before the invitation. And as soon as the invitation started, he intercepted that big old boy at the back door. And he said, sir, I've watched you every night during the invitation. You would jump up and run. I just want to know why you're doing that. What's causing this? Why, why are you so upset? And the young man began to shake and he began to tremble and he grabbed his shirt with both hands and ripped it open, exposing his bare chest. And he said, preacher, a long time ago, I gave my life to the devil and those people that I did that with, they tattooed a picture of the devil across my heart. Preacher, I can't give my life to Jesus. That invitation just gives me so much trouble. I just can't, I, I can't stand it. I can't be there. And the preacher responded with some surprising words. He says, that's good news. That's good news. The young man didn't know how to respond to that. And the preacher said, hey, let me tell you something. You may have the da devil pat tattooed on your heart, on your chest. But Jesus wants to come into your heart. And greater is he that is in you than he that is on you. And that old boy got gloriously saved. He went on to become a preacher and evangelist. And thousands of people came to faith in Christ as a result of God using his testimony. May I tell you today, listen closely, listen closely. I don't care how bad you've been and where you are in life right now. God can change you. God can transform you. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you and give you a brand new